All right, uh, hello and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Basma Majerbi. I'm a professor of finance at the Gustafsson School of Business. I'm actually joining here today from my office at the University of Victoria. So I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging with respect the uh, uh, Lukwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Exquimalt, uh, Sanish people whose traditional relationship with the land continue to this day. Uh, joining me today uh, from, um, from England is uh, uh, Mr. Michael um, Nihan, uh, whom I'll ask uh, to introduce himself in a minute. I'm uh, absolutely uh, delighted to have Michael join me today, uh, not only because of his uh, tremendous experience about the topic of uh, sustainable finance and particularly impact investing, but also he's uh, our own uh, UV grad, uh, one of the many ambassadors that we have who are trying tirelessly to, uh, uh, you know, through their work to make the world a, a better place. So, Michael, uh, welcome. And uh, you. why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Meehan. Uh, graduated in 05, I believe, the UVic MBA. Uh, but since then, uh, I went down to Silicon Valley and started out my career in uh, sustainable finance. Um, we, uh, as a, a group of mine, invented one of the first carbon trading systems down there. Uh, I wound up in Silicon Valley for about eight years after I sold that company and two others. Um, then went on to advise the Obama administration and the end of the uh, Bush administration uh, while I was down there on um, uh, carbon finance and climate finance. Um, worked with the California Senate uh, and then got tapped to run uh, the Global Reporting Initiative. So CEO of the Global Reporting Initiative for uh, several years in Amsterdam. Uh, but these days I live in London, England. And I'm the chair of the UK Sustainable Investment Finance Association. Uh, it's one of the largest SIPs um, in the world. Um, assets under management of that membership is about um, seven trillion. So it's a, it's a fairly large sustainable investment group. Um, I'm also vice chair of the Natural Capital Coalition and several different foundations, uh, one of which uh, is uh, focused on systemic impact. So happy to be here and thanks for asking me to come. Yeah, thank you for, for uh, actually uh, joining uh, us here. Um, I'm going to um, just go, before we start our conversation, just go over uh, very quickly uh, over some logistics here. Uh, so you are all uh, joining in uh, on uh, listening uh, only mode. There is no video for the audience. Uh, we have disabled the chat, but you can actually use the Q&A window and we encourage you to use it to uh, type your questions or vote for some of the questions that you want answered. We will take the questions at the end. And uh, during the presentation, we'll also uh, launch some polling questions just to get your views on some topics. And I wanna uh, also inform everyone that the session is being recorded and uh, hopefully will uh, uh, will be available uh, later on on the Gustafsson uh, web, web, website. Okay, so uh, before we start, um, I, I just like to actually take uh, an opportunity to use this platform and uh, also um, express my solidarity to the wave of protests that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Uh, starting in the US, but also now spreading to many countries around the world. You see here a couple of, you know, a few pictures. One of them is uh, from Victoria just on Sunday. And um, uh, the questions that I would like to put out here for, for the audience, and I encourage you to vote, is, uh, you know, issues like this, like syst systemic racism, for example, do you think it's an investment issue? And should investors uh, uh, you know, consider that in their, uh, when they actually uh, make decisions about investing. So um, we're going to launch the first polling questions. And um, I'll wait a few seconds. So investors, so just uh, the question says investors should align their capital with social justice objectives. And, um, and whether you agree, uh, it could be, yes, I agree, or I agree, but it's not possible to do so within the current system, or you don't think this is an investment issue. 
So I see, still see some people answering the question. And um, almost getting there. <laughs> Only a few more are still thinking. Asma, let me know what you think you want to yeah. end. Yeah, I think we, we have maybe enough votes uh, to end the poll and you will see the results just as uh, I see them at the same time. Uh, so it's interesting, almost a 50-50 split between yes, I agree, and I know it's possible to do within the current system of frameworks and tools for investing. And uh, yes, I agree, it's important, but um, I don't think it's possible. Um, so, you know, systemic racism, diversity and inclusion in the workplace and, and, and other uh, social issues like this um, are actually um, part of what we call uh, ESG issues that investors look at. Um, I don't know if uh, Michael wants to, to comment on this uh, um, before I pass on to the first questions, but do, do, do you think this is actually um, uh, you know, it, it's part of, you know, what impact investing can uh, an impact investor should look at these type of social issues. Uh, and can you help us understand, you know, where does this fit in the sustainable finance, uh, uh, you know, spectrum here? Yeah, well, of course they should, right? Um, uh, not only because, I mean, all investors, not just, and I'll, we'll come back to this probably several times throughout this conversation, but all investors should be looking at this. Uh, whether they care about social justice or not, um, these represent some pretty significant systemic risks, um, regardless of whether you're running an impact fund or whether your portfolio has anything to do with impact. Um, these things are obviously um, uh, you know, key um, uh, risks that you really need to be taking into account. Um, and that really goes for not just equality or social justice, but climate change and, and um, you know, access to education and all of these things. And as we get into this, all of these things are connected. So as, um, as you may know, this, this, uh, the, the riots that are going on around the world aren't just about race. It's about gross inequality across a range of things. And uh, people are just absolutely fed up uh, with that. And um, so all of these, these, these specific impacts are all included in the one outcome that everybody wants, which is more equality. Um, and uh, that's what's driving a lot of this. And so as an investor, if you're not looking at these large trends, um, then eventually they will come home to roost. And so well-diversified funds, well-diversified portfolios, impact and non-impact um, that take these things into uh, account are, are usually better off in anticipating these types of risks. Okay, sounds great. So, um, so let's, uh, let's jump in uh, uh, to our topic on uh, specifically on impact investing. And uh, uh, because the audience is quite diverse here, some of them are actually from the uh, finance, uh, finance professionals and others are not. Uh, we have a second question that we would like to launch right now, uh, which is, you know, when you hear people talking about impact investing, what does come to your mind? What do you think they are talking about? Um, well, it... So while Michael is actually expressing, so I'm just going to ask the audience to try to also uh, chime in on this question and uh, take a, just a you know, few seconds to, to see where the views of the audience uh, stand here when people talk about impact investing. And then I'm, I'm going to uh, you know, give uh, Michael a chance to actually um, explain to us from his point of view and other investors' point of view, what do we mean by impact investing? Okay, so um, we still have a few answers coming in. Thank you very much for voting. This is really interesting. Um, I'm going to stop here because I think we're covering pretty much most uh, 
of the answers. And Michael, you can see here what people think about when we uh, talk about impact investing. And uh, my question to you is, you know, what do you think? And how do you actually, can you help us distinguish between what is impact investing versus socially responsible investing or ESG investing or other forms yeah. of sustainable finance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is a good one. It's important. I, I think it's important. It's surprising to you or not to see this. <laughs> No, it's not. <laughs> I particularly like the 13.8%, right? Not sure what this means. And I think they're, you know, that's, it's good to be honest on this because, um, and regardless of the, 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 the maturity of the audience, it's good to level set on these things because I sit in meetings today with, you know, asset managers managing multi-billion portfolios that use these terms interchangeably. Um, and sometimes even incorrectly. Um, so there's two ways of looking at this. There's, there's, there's uh, the technical terms of, of what this all means, um, and then how people sort of use them. So generally, you think of it like an onion, the sustainable investing market, the sustainable finance market uh, in the world is vast, right? And on the outside, it's about 28 to $30 trillion worldwide. It's enormous. Um, and on the outside, you have things like infrastructure fund, funds, you've got economic development funding, you've got FDI flows, foreign direct investment flows, um, that are all tied to certain impacts. They're tied to gender equality, they're tied to sustainability, um, you know, bailout money that's tied to certain uh, sustainability goals or environmental goals. These are all included in that. The next layer down, you've got this, uh, uh, you know, the areas of uh, pension funds or sovereign wealth funds, the asset managers, and these guys are really looking at more do no harm than impact, right? So they're looking at positive or negative exclusions, what goes into a fund, what doesn't go into a fund. And the reason they do that is because they have tens of thousands of investments or thousands of investments, and you know it's very, very difficult to uh, do deal each, each individual investment. Um, and then closer to the center of the onion, you've got the impact world. And the impact world is a little bit different. These are the family offices, venture capital, individual investors, private equity, uh, private wealth, retail, right? This, this type of investment is where a lot of the excitement is, but compared to the overall sustainable uh, finance market or responsible finance market, it's actually quite small, it's about 500 billion. Now it's doubled in size over the past 18 months. Um, uh, for a lot of different reasons. The, 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 the larger market is still growing at, at a pretty pretty good clip, about 30%. 30 um, but this is where the most interesting things are. So when people talk about impact, they're usually talking about a lot of different things. So if you think about responsible investment as sort of the whole basket, impact is really that small sub, well, relative small, 500 billion, um, that's focused on um, creating change or having actually influencing outcomes that we want to see in the world. Does that, does that level set? Yeah, it gives us a, yeah. uh, it gives us a, a good uh, overview of the, the different, um, of the different, uh, you know, the, the wide spectrum that exists here. And uh, just to, um, you know, elaborate a little bit on that. I'm trying to share my screen, uh, which is not working here. Well, um, well while, you, while you get that up, I can give yeah, you an I idea. Think I, of... I think you can see it now. Okay. Um, basically, that's the problem with technology and uh, so basically what you were describing, Michael, here is this wide range of sustainable finance strategies, starting from, you know, the do no harm exclusion, exclusion, you know, of certain sectors or certain types of companies going all the way to uh, trying to uh, specifically target, you know, some outcomes, uh, whether it's on the social or the environmental, uh, environmental side. So, um, so if we zoom in on uh, this impact, you know, uh, or what, what is referred to sometimes focusing on measurable high impact solutions, can you um, elaborate a little bit on that and, and, and give us some, um, some examples? So in the, in the literature or in the research, I find it sometimes a little bit confusing actually, 
Um, so for instance, you know, one popular definition of impact investing that you must be very familiar with is, uh, you know, that it is intended to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside the financial return. So what's your take on that? And what does it mean really in practice? You know, can you really yeah. actually have both or is there a trade-off or, you know, what does they the, actually work in practice? Yeah, there's a lot wrapped up into this. And I, I suspect why the Jin chose this um, is because they want to include intentionality, right? Is that you are intending to use funds to create a certain outcome. They want to include social and environmental because these are two very big tags that a lot of, uh, foundations, including some of the ones that I'm involved in, are, are, are sort of tied to. Um, but they also want to say that these things are not exclusive to financial return. If you go back to the, the slide that you had just a second ago, I, I don't love that, 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 that definition, but I understand why they've chosen that definition. It, it's these types of um, uh, um, diagrams, I think, and I know why you chose it because you're showing, but it creates a false narrative, I think, in the marketplace that has always been here. There's two major false narratives within, in, within impact investing. One is this, this, this false idea that, um, that uh, impact means lower returns. Um, it has at some point in time, but only because of the way that the portfolios were built, not because of what the companies were doing. So the quality of investment and the type of investment it is are not at odds with one another. Uh, I'm one of those believers that I, I don't believe that there should be anything called impact investing or sustainable investing or sustainable business. They're just business and investment. And that sustainability metrics, impact metrics, they need to be part of the, the, the investment process. So that's, that's the first thing. The other thing is that that I think over the years, and, and I've been guilty of it as well, but the sustainability community, I think, has been, has created a black box around what they do and made it very, very difficult for investors to really get their heads around um, impact and sustainability in such a way that it now requires experts and sustainability to even take a step in the right direction. That's one of the things that we tried to do with the SDGs, which I, I hope we talk about sustainable development goals at some point in time tonight, um, or today for most of you. Um, but having that, um, having this lexicon that is not shared with the, with the investment world has been a real um, um, way for, I think the, the sustainability practitioners and really the sustainability industry today at keeping investors from really making steps on their own. And I'm one of the people in the market would like to see the end to all that. I would like to see this, you know, that, that impact investing is just investing. It's just, you're using a different set of metrics to do it. Um, in terms of, you know, um, I think it's, 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 I mean, in my opinion, I, I agree with you that you need to, to think about the impact and so on. But if you, if you are a, a manager of a portfolio or you're always thinking about, you know, uh, measuring the, the, the impact, right? So this is one of the issues that, you know, okay, we know how to measure financial returns, but how do we measure, uh, uh, measure the impact? And um, yeah. I recently, uh, you know, this, ha this has been uh, uh, in a recent report by um, IFC, the International Finance Corporation, trying to kind of, you know, provide some clarity about, you know, what is impact investing. And, and, and again, it's, it's described or, you know, it's distinguishing characteristic uh, compared to other sustainable finance uh, strategies like using ESG, um, uh, you know, um, risk uh, metrics or uh, ESG scoring for selecting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, ESG integration or other forms of responsible investing. Um, it just really puts this intent as well as, you know, um, the, the, measure, the measurement of the impact that is created, right? Whether uh, it's an impact on, um, uh, on an environmental uh, outcome or, uh, or, uh, or a social one. Uh, don't you think this help actually bring some clarity? Because, because uh, you know, people 
let's say if I'm an individual investor and I want to invest and you know, I, I approach some fund managers and everyone can claim that, yeah, this is an impact fund, right? So how do I, how do I actually have that kind of assurance that it is doing mm -hmm. what it is supposed to do, right? Yeah, well, well th this is good, although it is missing key components, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, proxy voting, where does that fit into this, right? Equality. Mm -hmm. Right, and, yeah, and, and not just equality in, in, in the outputs of an organization, uh, on, on the internal workings of an organization. How do you ensure uh, that, say, gender equality in boards is represented uh, in a company using this model? You couldn't, because it's limited. I think the idea is that you look at, with, with this idea of intent, the, the easy way to look at, um, at uh, impact investing is don't think about impacts up front. Don't think about themes. We'll, we'll talk about thematic investing at some point and why I think it's, um, uh, you know, it, it needs to evolve. But um, think of the outcomes that you're looking for, right? Um, and then determine all of the different types of impacts that you will need to address to reach that outcome. It's literally as simple as that. Now, you can use various frameworks and standards and all of the tools and all the acronyms that you like uh, to get there, um, but that's essentially what it is. Outcomes, focus on the outcomes, not the impacts, and then create your basket of impacts that you need to address, either within your own portfolio, or within your partners, or within, um, uh, you know, within uh, uh, partner funding or whatever it's going to be, uh, but make sure that those are addressed in some way to be able to reach the impacts you're looking for. Okay. Um, so, Michael, um, I recognize you mentioned a little bit uh, of uh, uh, about the size being really small earlier. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to to um, show to the audience what we are uh, talking about, um, and recognizing that it's really difficult actually to define impact, as we've seen from the poll, but also in practice, people have different views on what impact investing uh, consists of. Um, I just want to show a little bit, you know, this is the number you mentioned earlier, I think, uh, yeah, the size yeah. globally. This is the, so some of the latest statistics uh, of the global uh, impact investing network. The market is estimated at about 500 billion. If you're wondering about the size of impact investing in Canada, it's, uh, um, you know, RIA has been running these biennial uh, um, surveys. I think the next one is coming up uh, this year, uh, but the last one from 2018 estimates the market for impact investing in Canada at $14 uh, billion. Mm. Um, I mean, it's been a huge um, uh, growth, as you mentioned. Um, but if you put this into the big picture, it's still a very tiny um, part of what we call sustainable investing. So here's, um, yeah. uh, just to give you an idea here, you can see um, what we refer to as, I mean, the dominant part here in the financial uh, industry and probably because it's what is mostly used now by institutional investors is what we call ESG integration. There's a lot of uh, asset under management that, you know, is using this framework um, in, in the trillions of dollars. There's also corporate engagement. And you look at the impact, it's actually very tiny despite the huge growth over the last mm -hmm. few uh, years. And something else that is growing exponentially is what we refer to as um, uh, sustainability themed investing. And I think you alluded to that earlier. Um, so I have a couple of questions here for you. First of all, I mean, more generally at the global level, uh, what do you think is driving the growth in impact investing? And, and for example, to take the case in Canada, uh, the 14, the growth from 8 billion to 14 billion uh, in two years, that's like 81% growth rate. It's double the growth of sustainable investing in general. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge growth and the same thing is observed, you know, globally. 
So what is driving uh, this growth? And, and, and I would like you also to comment on, you know, what's the difference between what is labeled as impact community investing versus sustainability themed investing? Yeah, so I guess there's a couple of things. Because if you think of the in, uh, impact investment, I think these numbers are pretty small, but it depends on how you define impact investing, exactly. especially in Canada. Canada is like Australia in terms of global markets, where the, the economy is driven by resources, right? We cut down trees, we do holes, and, and, and so on. There's always that joke. I used to live in uh, Victoria, BC. Well, you know, I used to live in Victoria, BC. And uh, we used to make this joke where we cut down the trees and sell it to the states and they sell us back the furniture, right? That, that's, that, that's the economy. It's not a services economy. And in those types of markets, Australia is very, very similar. And in those types of markets, it is really, really tough um, to find quality approaches to impact in finance. Um, now, that's 20 years ago. Today, all kinds of really interesting things are happening at the retail level. So uh, private wealth for banks, right? So C CIBC and the Dodigs are up there, you know, talking about purpose and how they're going to transform banking. You've got TD and RBC creating green bonds. You've got First Nations Development Bank doing some very interesting things on um, systemic sustainability for First Nations communities um, and uh, bonds, which is, uh, amazing. It's actually kind of a blueprint for the world. Um, so a lot of these things fit within impact investing. I don't know if they'd be included in this or not, but interesting stuff. Um, but what's driving a lot of this, not just in Canada, but around the world, is, is a couple of things. If you think about the makeup of, of, of the impact world, right, where we're talking about the onion, the, the center of the onion, this is where all the exciting stuff is. This, you know, you're not talking about a uh, you know, an endowment that's saying, hey, we're not going to invest in tobacco and firearms, and that's it. it. You're talking about the really interesting things to say, how could we put a fund together that promotes economic development in First Nations communities? That's interesting, right? That's an outcome worth shooting for. And then putting together all the really interesting impacts that will lead you to that goal. Um, the reason it's more interesting now is because of the constituents in that market. You've got family offices, right, which uh, um, have uh, the younger constituents in the family offices that are now running the offices or, or at least leading the decisions in the offices, have a seat at the table, um, are much, much more concerned about social, uh, social environment uh, uh, governance issues than they ever were before. Um, venture capital. Uh, you've got some great venture capital firms in Canada, right? some really, really great ones, uh, but there's not that many of them, <laughs> but they're really, really good, the ones that are there. Uh, and they've been banging on this drum for a really, really long time, and they've been making some really, really interesting contributions to impact. Um, private wealth and retail, as we talked about, the banking industry, I think um, in many ways the Canadian banking industry was, I don't want to say last of the game, but it is pretty far behind what, what I see in in, in uh, Europe and, and even the UK to some extent, but definitely European banks are far, far ahead. Um, but they're getting there and you're starting to see that. And so I think you'll see this type of thing accelerate much more um, over the next couple of years. Oh, one other thing I would mention is um, the rise of sort of these innovative uh, innovation accelerators, um, uh, um, <laughs> Um, you know, innovation hubs, uh, all of these types of things in Canada, as we've seen over here and in Europe, really like so Mars and Toronto and these groups, even though they've been ticking away at this in a long time, they finally kind of came across a, um, a formula that works and can churn out a lot of IP generating businesses for investors. So at the angel level and at the seed level, um, you can actually, there's some interesting things there that you can get involved with and you don't have to worry about losing your shirt. Um, those models have existed in other parts of the world, but in Canada, I think it's actually matured a little bit now. So you've got these, these things that are driving each of the constituents in the impact market that make for a pretty interesting mix, um, especially in a country where um, the impact community is very, very different than the institutional investment uh, market. It's interesting that you mention angel investing because until recently, um, you know, I mean, 
we uh, we we tried. Uh, you know, my, one of my colleagues, Michael King, and I have been in talk with the National um, Capital uh, Organization of Canada, uh, the Angel Capital Organization of Canada, and uh, ah. we tried to actually embark in a research project. There is actually a national consultation right now going on. And the idea is that we want to actually study the extent of impact investing in the angel community because there is not a lot of research about that. It'd be a thin <laughs> report. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then, you know, maybe, maybe bring that into the conversation because we often think about institutional investors and we think about, uh, you know, maybe, uh, as you said, wealth, mm -hmm. family offices, but we don't necessarily really uh, get into that conversation. Although, as you mentioned, there are many uh, um, interesting initiatives happening here. Um, I recently have been in contact with uh, um, uh, an accelerator here in Vancouver, uh, Spring Activators, with, which is actually offering an impact investing uh, training, which is uh, great because it's talking directly with entrepreneurs, innovators, and the investment community and using also uh, this narrative of impact investing at the CD. Yeah which is really important, even though the amount of capital involved might not be, um, you know, at the scale that you need to actually move the needle, but it's still a good start. Um, so you mentioned the SDG earlier, and um, I'd like to ask the uh, audience, how familiar are they with the SDG? So um, we're gonna launch another polling question and um, basically here, just very, very quickly, without thinking too hard or you know, Googling anything, how familiar are you with the SDGs and whether you think uh, this should be in the radar, on the radar of you know, private investors? It's not a matter of you know, government policy and public sector institutions who are working in uh, in this field. So um, just give us a sense and, um, and uh, we'll uh, just try to um, link this to impact investing because it's part of the frameworks that is increasingly, uh, uh, you know, popular or being more used by um, new investors who are embarking into impact investing and finding uh, you know, looking for a framework to use to define impact. So I'm gonna end uh, the poll here and you can see here that, you know, like close to 20% of people have no idea about the SDGs and uh, a, a, a percentage of the audience think that this is not the domain of investors, private sector mm -hmm. participants. Um, this is probably a little bit representative, although in the general population, yeah. I suspect, you know, more people have absolutely no idea about the SDGs. So we're going to show you some icons that represent the SDGs. And um, my question uh, to, to Michael, uh, and, you know, every time you look at, uh, I look at these SDGs, I'm inspired, but I'm also really discouraged because if you yeah. look at the estimates of the massive amount of capital needed to reach these ambitious goals is just like we're nowhere near right and so yeah. one of the estimates is that it will take you know like the gap is estimated at about six trillion per year and yeah. One of the biggest fears of many people, particularly in the non-profit you know, sector, but also investors, is that with the pandemic, right, there's a, there's a real concern that any progress on this front uh, is going to be delayed, right? And there might be more challenges, but I hope there are also opportunities. And so if you can, um, you know, talk to us a little bit uh, about these challenges and opportunities uh, do you see for impact investors to truly contribute to these goals? And, um, you know, I, yeah. I, I'd like to hear your view on this, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, um, 
the poll you just did, uh, uh, that's pretty much where I thought it would be, even though the first two questions were not mutually exclusive. But uh, I, I was lucky enough to, to uh, be uh, involved with the UN, the UNGC, as, in, in my capacity as a CEO of GRI to, to, to help shape the, the SDGs and work with companies to do it. And they really are different. They really are different than the Millennium Development Goals because they include companies. Whereas the first ones didn't, it was more of a sort of a top-down thing and companies got it as isn't really relevant to me. Um, so this was actually created with the involvement of thousands of different companies and the heads of different organizations. But that said, I'll qualify this in a second, but this is not an impact investment tool. These were, this is for development. These, this, these are very focused on development. Uh, not particularly focused on impact investors. However, we in the impact community can definitely use these in a lot of different ways. So when we look at this and we go, oh, six, six trillion a year funding grab, and we go, how are we ever going to reach that? Well, the sustainable investment market, responsible investment market is already at 30 trillion. So there, there is investment flows out there that this fits into. It certainly doesn't fit within the impact investment community, but we have a role to play in this. Um, the, what I like about the SDGs, well, there's two things I like about the SDGs. Number one is it makes it super simple to understand, okay, here are the, again, these, this, this impact outcome verbiage I keep using. If you're thinking of the outcomes that you really want as an impact investor in your portfolio or your own personal investments or whatever it's going to be, um, this is great, right? Because it, it doesn't, it doesn't highlight the impacts. It, 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 it focus us on these big, big outcomes and then scales them back under each one of these. There's, you know, there's a whole ton of, of very, very specific things that it looks at. Um, again, mostly development related. But as, a, uh, as an investor, you look at this and say, okay, well, these are the outcomes I want to align with, right? I want to align with gender equality. The second thing I like about this is the way that these are built. And I'm, this is definitely not the way that they're used in the marketplace, but we can talk about that in a minute. But these things are supposed to be joined up together. So if I'm an investor, or say I'm a philanthropist, and I want to be able to um, promote uh, health and well-being of women in Africa, right? Uh, or, or say I'm an entrepreneur and I have a solution. That's, that's the market I want to be able to provide. Um, there are, you can't just provide something that focuses on gender equality. It has to focus on, uh, sorry, health and well-being. It has to focus on gender equality. It has to focus on education. It has to focus on infrastructure. It has to focus on partners. So you can see how these things are all linked up. You can't do just one. Um, that's the way they're supposed to be used. Now with thematic investing, and one of the reasons I get on about thematic investing, is because I understand the, the attraction to thematic investing, right? To say, my fund is focused on climate, gender, and infrastructure, say, right? It's impossible to focus on only those things within those categories without opening yourself up to risks, um, these impacts, these unseen impacts that contribute to the outcomes that you're looking for. So instead of thematic investing around a certain thing, a much more, um, uh, I'd say, a, well, holistic, but a much more comprehensive portfolio strategy for any investor is to focus on an outcome and then look at all of the different impacts that, are, that, that will deliver that outcome to you. The reason the SDGs, is we are, the way I like them, the way, the way they're laid out, is because it provides at least the start of a map for impact investors on how to identify what those things are. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect yeah. sense. Um, although in practice, it's a little bit difficult, right, to implement. Um, is, well, is I think it's difficult. I think yeah. it's difficult because we have too many sustainability people in the room. 
<laughs> so, so when you talk about holistic approach, is so I was really intrigued when I read about your work uh, about this uh, approach that you refer to as systemic impact. Is that what you were referring to when you say you cannot just yeah. focus on one thing? You have to look at the whole system and all the pieces that contribute to that outcome. So can you elaborate yeah. a little well, bit on that and maybe give us some examples that, you know, just to understand what, what does this mean actually in practice? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and, and as we certainly didn't come up with it. So I chair a, 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 an organization called Systemic Impact Foundation. And what the foundation does, and we didn't come up with it. This is just an extension of what um, uh, foundations and family offices and funds have been doing for a long time. But as this this as the impact world really started to take shape right and it really started to accelerate accelerating in canada but it's, it's accelerating in other parts of the world even faster and what we saw was oh this impact this this is an impact uh um uh, fund that focuses on sdgs three five and seven right and it, it's like well that that's not how these work that's not how you're supposed to do these things um when I ran GRI, we had the exact same problem. We had corporations just checkboxing, right? And they were going through the motions of, of disclosure. The idea is that they're supposed to uh, understand and communicate their commitment to uh, you know, sustainability through this disclosure, not check a bunch of things off so, they're in, you know, so their investors are happy. But that's the way they use it. And so we found investors doing the exact same thing in the impact world. I'm like, oh, okay, we need to, we need to create something to be able to keep this from happening. Um, let's go back to our example of uh, women in Africa. Look at the, uh, and I think I used this example when we were talking before. If you look at something like um, the microfinance or microcredit, um, uh, what, that, that today that market is like 10 billion, eight and a half billion US, I think. Um, and almost totally funded by um, well, there's some development funding in there, but a lot of that microfinance market is through um, venture capital, uh, you know, angel investment, family offices, you know, those types of groups. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find any of those groups that were really looking to um, do anything other than improve the lives of, of you know, funding the unfunded, banking the unbanked, uh, but mostly women in Africa, you know, and uh, uh, having a way to lift them out of poverty. But because, so that's, that's the impact that, some, that, that an investor has in their heads. So whether they do, they go out, they find all kinds of great companies, they go through the due diligence process and provide those companies access to that market. And where, where are we 15 years after, you know, billions of uh, investment in that market? Well, certainly some of those, those solutions have panned out, but many of them haven't. There's an entirely new form of slavery in sub-Saharan Africa uh, with women uh, being, uh, you know, because there's loan sharks and women are selling their homes or kids to pay off these loans. Um, uh, there was no reference given to um, uh, even socioeconomic issues like uh, having a female breadwinner in the family, which is in some of these regions a thing. And so um, the impact dollars that went into this wound up making lives worse for women instead of better. So you go, well, how the heck did we get here? Well, it's because investors took a myopic view mm. on an impact and said, ah, that's, 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 that's the outcome I want, but it wasn't, right? To do something like uh, microfinance and microcredit in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you need to be looking at, if you're looking at the menu of SDGs you're looking at on the screen, you need to be looking at gender, you need to be looking at poverty alleviation, you need to be looking at policy, infrastructure, partnerships, you need to be looking at all of these things. I'm not saying that, that an investment firm needs to do all of these things, but that's the whole idea behind SDG 17. You need to have partners that are looking at these things. Otherwise, um, you could have the exact opposite impact, right, than you're, than you're really looking for. So again, focus on the outcomes, use frameworks like the SDGs or other to identify all the different types of um, uh, impacts that will contribute to those outcomes, whether you're gonna address them or not, and then invest accordingly, instead of just thinking about impact and going for it. 
because that, you know, we're in, in if you look at the alternative meats section, uh, the uh, market right now, Impossible Burger and all these different groups, very, very cool stuff. Two different types, right? There's plant-based meat and cell-based meat. We are heading for a very, very similar approach um, and a very, very similar reckoning, I think, in that market there, uh, based on the exact same, everybody jump in, confuse impacts with outcomes, think myopically about the investment without thinking of these unseen impacts around it, and then impact investors will be left on the other side crying. We went through this uh, market uh, in the early days of carbon, uh, carbon management, carbon trading, you know, things like that. Um, the carbon monetization market, which is functional in a lot of different parts of the world, had the exact same problem, a myopic approach to investment, impact investment that didn't work. Um, however, if we approached it that holistically, you could. So anyway, what the foundation does is it creates free, it's a public good, it's, it's not a, a revenue generating institution. Um, it provides um, uh, models for this. So say food security, right? Or food systems, like, like we were just talking about alternative meats, right? If I'm th thinking about investing or starting an alternative meats company or investing an alternative meats company or a future of food portfolio for impact, what the foundation does is it actually creates a mapping of, okay, well, this is what you want. Here's all the impacts that you need to worry about. Here's how they're weighted. <laughs> so then either you address them through your fund or you address them through partners, but no matter what, they need to be addressed or this thing will be brittle in terms of a dependable investment. Okay. That's, that's what we mean by systemic investment. But to be yeah. honest with you, it's how many investors have been doing it for a long time. It's just what we see with this, especially with the impact world, we see a gold rush into impacts in a way that we don't think will be successful. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this is, um, though, I mean, this need for having models and, uh, and measurements and, you know, think about unintended consequences, right, of if you focus yeah. on just one thing. Um, do you think uh, standards, you know, help with that? And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm asking this because in the impact space, just, you know, I'm not even talking about all of sustainable finance and the different frameworks and the disclosure, you know, mm -hmm. framework like the CFD, CDP, all these kind of things. But just, for, you know, things that impact investors sometimes look at, there are so many different frameworks and, and measurement system. It's a little bit confusing. And, um, mm -hmm. On the one hand, you, you might think, okay, this is good because you, you want to make sure that there's no <laughs> impact washing, right? And you, you, you actually look at different uh, aspects of, of impact. Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't know, it becomes so overwhelming and confusing for people starting in the field. Okay, what do I use? It's also very costly to report yeah. on different frameworks. I mean, you've been leading the GRI, which is a sustainability standard, you know, setting organization. And but yeah, yeah, yeah. To do that, there yeah. are so many other organizations and there's no harmony in terms of the different reporting systems. So what's your, your take on that? And what is, what is your advice to impact investors where to navigate this and how- my, my, my candid advice to impact investors is forget about this. This is, Number one, these are not standards, right? And if you're talking about, we, we, we went this way in the sustainability uh, disclosure world with GRI, with CDP, you know, um, IRC and all of these things. They all do a very, very important thing in the market, but not the thing that people are looking for. And they're not all standards, actually. Um, the difference between a standard and a framework is, is immense. So... The responsible investment world, if you're putting $200 billion into a, you know, a dam project and you need to ensure that, you know, different uh, environs, uh, environmental and social aspects of this thing is going to work. Yeah, for sure. You need standards, right? That is a slow process. It's huge dollars. It, the, the impacts out of that project are immense and multiple, um, but it's slow. Right? But you need those standards to be able to keep everybody on board. In the impact investing world, I am, 
I differ from a lot of people in my field that I don't believe we need standards. And in fact, I think standards slow things down. And I fully realize that there's a lot of people within the impact investing world that are saying, well, you know, we can't really do a whole lot because we really need these standards for comparability. No, you don't. What you do need are helpful frameworks to use to be able to help you determine what kind of investments that you're going to make, what types of portfolios that you will build, and how to compare those portfolios. But standards, I think, for a market this small, because as you standardize, things get slower and slower and slower. And that's okay, because in some of those very large markets, you need that type of methodical um, uh, approach, that standardization. Um, I think it's wrong uh, for impact investors to look for standards or to really blame standards for uh, the lack of action uh, in impact. There are more than enough standards, uh, or sorry, more than enough frameworks to help them kind of get their heads around what they want to do. Cambridge Leadership Group has a great, even though it's thematic, has a great approach to it. Uh, uh, GIN has a great approach. PRI uh, has their own sort of framework for impact investors. And the idea is, here's an impact, here's a, here's a framework to get you started. You don't have to use it all. No one's, no one's going to come to you and say, you know, let's verify this against the standard for accreditation or anything like that. Well, at least I hope they don't. Um, and that's where those things should go. But more standardization doesn't always mean a good thing. Look at SASB in the U.S. So some of your, your listeners today may know what SASB is. I think it's a fantastic idea. It's like a, it's like a GRI disclosure standard for companies in the U.S. to report to the SEC. So it's a way to get this in, into the SEC. Um, and it's a great thing. But first of all, we don't know if, if, if that will ever happen. But number two is once you put this on your disclosures to the SEC, then your sustainability issues become legal issues. And what you find is that corporates report less and less and less and less as, as closer as you get to that. So in the impact investment world, we're not about less and less. We're about more and more. We want more throughput, more deal flow, not less. So standards, I think, um, don't, don't get sucked down the rabbit hole of all of these standards and frameworks. Find something that works for you. Find something that's comparable to others and use that um, instead of uh, relying on standards. Okay. So I think it's time to take some questions from the audience. We're running a little bit out of time. It's a fascinating conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I have many other questions. I've never, I've never been accused here. of being concise. Uh, yeah. I'm going to stop here. Um, there's a, I'm going to go through some of the questions and maybe we can take them very briefly. Um, I have a question here. Uh, do we know if the fund flow performance relationship depends in some way on whether the fund follows ESG or impact investing goals? I'm not really aware of any um, evidence yeah, here. I don't know if, Michael, you have any... Uh, well, there's definitely many reports for comparing uh, impact funds performance to non-impact funds, right? But as far as impact versus ESG, mm -hmm. well, they're kind of the same thing, right? So again, what, what some people call ESG investing, other people call impact investing. Some people, yeah, so don't get wrapped up in the acronyms. Um, so I think that's what the question was asking, was mm -hmm. ESG versus impact. In the yeah. impact investing world, there is no change. There is no difference. Okay, um, I have another question here um, from, uh, which says, which investors are leaders, both thought leaders and in terms of asset under management in impact investing? Who is leading the charge, basically? Well, hmm. since I chair representative organizations in this, I cannot name names. Okay. However, <clears throat> you should be on the lookout <laughs> for very large funds that make a lot of noise um, about uh, uh, their credentials in, uh, in, in sustainable investing, um, especially around things like divestment um, and, and things like that. Because what many of them do, will do is say, hey, we're starting up, uh, you know, their assets under management of five trillion, but hey, we're starting up a $40 million impact fund. Isn't that great? Which is a drop in the bucket. 
Um, and then on the back end, they're fighting against things like proxy voting and all kinds of things. So um, leaders don't always, leaders are not always leaders in this space. Mm -hmm. um, so even if I could name them, uh, it, it wouldn't even be relevant. Okay. I'm going to move on to another question here, uh, which says, uh, what are the challenges for sustainable finance or impact investors to work with for-profit sector and non-not-for-profit sector together towards impact generation? I don't I think you can think about, you know, the partnership basically like SDG 17 or something. Yeah, like SDG 17, yeah. But no, it's, uh, there, there are no challenges. There are several um, for-profit and non-profit organizations out there um, that, that work together on these things. Um, and uh, it, especially in this space, because everybody is running towards the same goal, maybe not for the right reason, right? One's for profit, one's not profit, but everybody's running towards the same goal. I think what you need to make sure though is, is credibility because there's a, it's a gold rush mentality out there in the impact world, which is, which is a dangerous thing for impact investors, right? Um, and even a, a more important thing for portfolio managers, right? How do you put all of these things together? So um, uh, credibility is, is your friend in this space. Uh, and there's a lot of people that have been bouncing around the space for decades. Um, use them, right? Okay. That, that's where you should start, or at least have them involved. Okay. Um, quick question here on cryptocurrencies. Does it have a role to play in impact investing? Oh my God, it, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely does. Crypto, well, more blockchain. Blockchain definitely does. We don't know when that will transform banking, but it, it will, right? And it solves so many of the equality issues within that within the finance space that I think it's inevitable. I just don't know when it's going to be. So crypto, well, crypto, I don't know when, but as the, as the representation of blockchain within the finance space, uh, it, it will be there someday. I just don't know when. I'm extremely interested in the sustainability, especially around the equality aspects of crypto. Okay. Very, very interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, what about, so there, there's another question here that says, um, how do you square financial thirst for growth with sustainability goals of impact investing? Is growth somehow sustainable? That's a kind yeah. of... A philosophical question but it's of a really course. good question right i mean like this yeah chasing eternal but, growth how is you know how do is there a yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. sustainability goals you know the one of my i i took in my undergrad at uvic i took uh, a, a, an environmental studies uh, elective which has got me interested in all of this thing mm -hmm. so cool thing and um uh, sustainable growth is what it was all about. Is it, is it even possible? And, you know, 75% of the class are saying no, right? I am a firm, firm believer that it is, right? That it, it, you just need to shape that growth, right? And so you'll have half the market saying, no, we can't move forward unless we have this. You'll have half the market trying to run as fast as they can, faster than everybody else. But yeah, it, you definitely can, but it depends on the type of growth. Can you have, uh, you know, Western growth in, uh, um, you know, emerging markets or transitional economies? Well, no, but, but that doesn't mean they can't grow. They will grow just in a different way. And I, I, they, they are definitely not mutually exclusive. Yeah, and this is, a, this is one of the biggest uh, dilemma or issues, right, when it comes to uh, climate change and uh, the energy transition. And, you know, when people talk about... Yeah just transition you have all these you know hundreds of millions of people still living in extreme poverty and they need you know they need this grow economic growth to improve their standards of life and it will also increase demand for energy at the same time we want to meet you know the net zero kind of um, objectives and goals and it, it becomes uh, kind of a little bit overwhelming and uh, 
difficult equation. Um, yeah, doesn't yeah, make it doesn't make it impossible though, right? It's so. not impossible, absolutely. I'm conscious of time. Uh, if there are other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We have another uh, webinar coming up. I'd like to take this opportunity <laughs> to thank uh, Michael for his contribution. And uh, um, we don't really have time. I had a couple questions for polling, but I I'd like to wrap it up <laughs> here and uh, and. Uh, uh, conclude our session. Uh, for, so um, what I take from this, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we have a lot of issues, a lot of problems, uh, and uh, the pandemic obviously brought that into light. Um, the positive message that I'd like everyone to leave with is that investors can make a difference in the way they allocate capital. Uh, there's a greater awareness of this and many people are asking questions about where their money is going. Uh, by not directing capital to address systemic issues in our society and in the environment, everyone is vulnerable to shocks, right? And I think, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to put this here, which was you know, an, an illustration of COVID-19 and the coronavirus and how it's affecting everything from the way we access education, from our health, from access to food, from, you know, and there are some really um, um, important uh, uh, impacts for people at, at, at all level globally, you know, that on the one hand, you can say, if we address some of these issues, like if we invested in our education, you know, in our health system, for example, it makes us less, you know, vulnerable to shocks like this, right? If we, if we, we had done uh, this kind of uh, capital allocation uh, to, to strengthen resilience and, and in the economy, that could help. And if we don't do it, everyone actually loses, right? So, um, let me hope that this pandemic actually um, is a way to rethink the way investors are uh, making decisions and what they want to achieve in terms of, I mean, to use your language, outcome, right? Versus um, what is your desired out outcome and how you can actually contribute to that. And uh, I think everyone is reading about many inspiring things. This is the moment to rethink, you know, not only investment, but many other ways of, you know, managing corporations and, and doing business. And um, I really like this uh, reset mentality. I think the World Economic Forum right now is running all the series of the great reset, right? Everybody's talking, let's use this as a moment to rethink you know, how we invest, how we do business, how we interact with each other. So I think um, this is an important moment for all of us to learn more about what we do. And um, just before I, uh, I, I leave, I uh, just wanted to let you know that we have a couple more. Uh, we have uh, I, another uh, uh, webinar next week uh, with um, Dawn who is also very, very active in this space. And I'm thrilled to have her join me in uh, the next part of this conversation, which will focus more on community recovery and resilience. So we'll have a much uh, uh, focused conversation about Canada and some examples about what the community uh, of impact investors is doing right now to help the community recovery and resilience. And uh, also my colleague Elango is having um, a, a webinar about looking for meaning in all workplaces, doing what you love, loving what you do. And I thought this is really also relevant for investors. Just do what you love and love what you do. So um, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, we're going to just uh, leave it here. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer questions offline. My email is here. And we will uh, make the slides available on our website. Thank you very much.